This was not the first nor the last accident of the de Havilland Comet. These planes actually kept disintegrating during mid-flight without any warning. It took several years and nearly 100 lives lost to solve the mystery of why it kept happening. The worst part? It probably could have been avoided if the designers hadn't made a huge statistical blunder. Stay tuned to find out why and how these failures led to a better understanding of one of the most critical weaknesses of metals and a discovery of a very important engineering law which is widely used today and has prevented thousands of accidents. At the end of the Second World War, the world of aviation was still dominated by propeller-driven planes. The jet engine, which is widely used today, was considered too inefficient for civil aviation. This changed in 1952 when the de Havilland Comet entered service as the first commercial jet-powered airliner. Even for today's standards, the de Havilland Comet was absolutely beautiful. It was sleek looking and its jet engines were beautifully integrated into the wings. To bypass the inefficiency of the jet engine, the Comet was designed to fly at an altitude of 10.5 kilometers, which was double the cruising altitude of the propeller-driven planes operating at the time. The high operating altitude meant thin air, hence less drag and higher efficiency. Though, this came at a price. The air was too thin for breathing, so the cabin had to be pressurized. The air pressure at an altitude of 10 kilometers is about 25% of the pressure at sea level. For passenger comfort, the cabin is pressurized to about 80% of the sea level pressure. This means that at cruising altitude, there is about half an atmosphere of pressure difference. This causes the cabin to expand, which results in material elongation and hoop stresses in the fuselage. During the descent, the outside and inside pressures would equalize and the fuselage would contract back to its original size. You can see how this repeated expanding and contracting will eventually tire the material and produce cracks. In the 1940s and early 50s, the knowledge of fatigue was very limited. In fact, the International Civil Aviation Organization did not even require any fatigue tests or calculations as part of the approval process. The de Havilland Company decided to go a step beyond the requirements and performed a fatigue test on a section of the fuselage. To simulate these conditions, de Havilland repeatedly cycled the pressure inside the cabin from 0 to 60 kPa and then back to 0. After about 18,000 such cycles, the section failed in fatigue, but since the design life of the Comet was to be 10,000 flights, well below the 18,000 flights estimated by the test, neither the designers nor the civil aviation organization were concerned about fatigue. Although this single fatigue test was valid, all parties were guilty of an enormous error. Let me know in the comments if you can figure out why their conclusion is a huge statistical blunder. If not, the answer will be discussed near the end of the video. On May 2nd, 1953, exactly one year after the first commercial flight, a de Havilland Comet disintegrated in mid-air soon after takeoff from the airport in Kolkata, India. The investigation concluded that the reason for the failure were the higher than usual loads imposed on the aircraft due to a tropical storm that was ravaging the area at the time. Alternatively, a pilot error was also listed as a possible cause for the crash. No one questioned the structural integrity of the plane itself. Seven months later, on January 10, 1954, a second, very similar crash occurred. It was yet another de Havilland Comet, which exploded mid-air near the island of Elba, but this time in perfect weather conditions. This plane had only flown for 1,286 flights, which was less than 13% of the estimated 10,000 flight design life. An investigation was launched, but the wreckage was not inspected. It was considered too difficult to obtain, since it was laying on the seabed about 180 meters below the sea surface. The investigation made a number of recommendations for improvements of the comet. However, with the exact cause of the failure still unknown, it was highly unlikely that these recommendations would fix the issue. Surely enough, only three months later, on April 8, 1954, another similar crash occurred. A third comet plane disintegrated in mid-air during its 903rd flight. At this point, it was undeniable something was wrong. All comets were grounded and a thorough investigation was launched. With three failures on the line, a new fatigue test of a full plane was requested. 
the Comet Yoke Uncle was taken from the fleet after flying 1,221 flights and was subjected to testing. The test was performed by pumping water in and out of the fuselage, with the entire fuselage submerged in water to offset the effects of the water weight. The wings were also loaded with hydraulic rams to simulate flying conditions. This accelerated testing showed severe weakness of the fuselage to fatigue crack growth around windows and escape hatches. The problem with openings is that they cause stress concentrations around them. For an elliptical opening, the stress concentration around the opening is about two times higher than the nominal stress. A rectangular opening with minor fillets on the corners experiences a stress concentration factor of more than three. These high stress zones accelerate the crack growth and reduce the life of the plane. This was known at the time, so the Haviland had thickened the metal around the windows. For that reason, contrary to popular belief, the square windows were not directly responsible for the failure of these planes. Although they did contribute, but they were not the main cause. After 3057 cycles of yoke uncle, a fatigue crack grew to failure originating from a rivet hole. In meanwhile, an effort was made to recover some of the wreckage from the second crash. Signs of fatigue were identified near one of the corners of the ADF windows. At the time, the skin of the airplane was attached to the airplane frame by bolts and rivets. This was problematic because punch riveting tends to cause cracks of severe size compared to glued joints, which was what the original design called for, but were considered too expensive to install. Often, the rivets and bolts would be in the vicinity of a window, but far enough so that they are not directly in the stress concentration zone. However, the cracks originating from the holes were free to grow in any direction. The cracks that grew away from the window approached a low stress zone and eventually halted. But the cracks that grew towards the window approached a high stress zone. This meant that with each loading cycle, the crack grew deeper and deeper into the highly stressed zone creating a positive feedback loop that caused an explosive crack growth and significantly decreased the fatigue life of the aircraft. A 1997 study stated that the use of riveting to fix such thin section aluminum sheets in the vicinity of cutouts was probably more damaging than the shape of the windows. The investigation also pointed out the statistical blunder that the Haviland company made prior to the accidents. Even though their test showed an estimated life of 18,000 flights, their random sample was not necessarily the weakest in the fleet, so it was wrong to assume that all planes would be able to achieve that fatigue life. The accidents happened within the first 4,000 cycles. These were the weakest samples in the fleet and failed first. A modern statistical analysis performs a large number of tests and takes the 5th percentile strength for design. This ensures that 95% of the samples would be able to reach the design value. Let me know in the comments if you would like to see a more detailed video on fatigue and fracture. As a result of the failures and consequent investigation, huge leaps were made in better understanding the fatigue and fracture of components. In the years following the accidents, a young American engineer by the name of Paul C. Paris worked as a faculty associate at Boeing studying the comet failure. Paris went on to publish the famous Paris Law, which is extensively used for estimating the life of components due to fatigue cracking and has saved millions of lives. For the de Havilland company, these failures caused a big setback, and by the time everything was resolved, the American competitors like Boeing and Douglas had caught up to the comet in terms of innovation and efficiency. In later years, Boeing admitted that the lessons learned from the comet helped them produce a safer plane and avoid the same pitfalls. Unfortunately, in engineering, success is often built on failures, and this is one such case. One thing is for sure though, without the de Havilland company, we would not enjoy the same reliability and comfort in air travel today. All modern airplanes are very strongly built. Virtually every component, body, wings, tailplane, and everything else is tested extensively to see how long it takes for cracks to appear. Regular tests are also performed during the aircraft's working life to check for any signs of structural failure. If inspections show even minute cracks in any part of the structure, airplanes are taken out of service for repair or they're permanently retired. Thanks for watching. If you really enjoyed the video, consider gifting us a coffee on the link in the description. 
See you next time.